<laughs> I don't know what that is. Okay. That's the good, the bad, and the ugly. There you go. <laughs> it's okay. awesome. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, Diocese of Central Florida Zoom Vestry Training. I do want to let you know that uh, this is being recorded. Uh, it will be available on the uh, diocesan website uh, when it's uh, processed. And also, I want to let you know that uh, both the PowerPoint presentation as well as the notes uh, will be are already posted on the website. So you don't have to write down everything I say. Uh, if you want to take just cryptic notes, um, all of the text and the notes will be available for you on download. The Lord be with you. <clears throat> Let us pray. Dear Lord, today we are new. New members, new leadership, new year, new sense of vitality. Help us to do the difficult work of embracing the new faces into the circle and new energy into our midst. Help us to know you as a God who makes all things new and sees each day as a new creation. Help us to know our history, but then to accept your call to leave what we know and to press onward. Help us also to sort out our relationships and then to ground ourselves in your love and not our preferences. Help us to trust our leaders knowing that a servant's heart will give them stature. All this we ask in the name of the one who took common people and made them saints. Amen. Amen. Uh, just as far as Zoom norms, I know we've all been on a million Zoom uh, since uh, last March, but please keep your microphone muted uh, unless you uh, have been recognized by me. Uh, if you have a question, if you will enter it in the chat feature, and I will be checking that from time to time. Uh, during the question and answer period, you're welcome to unmute, unmute your microphone and speak freely. And if you have any technical questions about Zoom, you can email them to Eric Perez, who is also monitoring this meeting. Um, this is me. Uh, in case you haven't met me, I'm Scott Holcomb. I've been the Canon to the Ordinary since officially October 1st of 2019. Uh, I've served as rector of six different parishes and assistant twice um, and entering my 42nd year of ordained ministry. So I'm delighted to be on the bishop's staff and I certainly bring a varied uh, experiences uh, to this uh, position. So um, today, we will be um, spending a, about two hours. Uh, if you need to get up and take a break or whatever, by all means, do that. Um, the um, uh, outline for today, we're going to be talking about what is the vestry, uh, lessons from the national and diocesan canons, we're going to talk about the scope of this ministry as vestry, um, have a question and answer time. We're going to spend uh, quite a bit of time talking about clergy discretionary funds and other issues that seem to keep resurfacing, uh, especially in um, my role as Canon to the Ordinary and we're going to be talking about resources that are available on the diocesan website. Um, this is part one of the training. Part two will be from 10 to two on March 13th. Um, we're going to be dealing with rector and vestry conflict. 
Now, I know you don't have any at your church, but just in case you ever do, uh, we'll be giving you some uh, guidelines and, and ideas about how to uh, deal with that and what may be behind it. We're going to be talking about clergy compensation and benefits. Um, we're looking at uh, life after COVID and how we can move into that faithfully. And of course, there'll be uh, Q and A time as well. That session on March 13th will also be recorded um, and the PowerPoint and notes uh, will be available for that as well. Um, why do we do vestry training? Uh, there were many years, uh, I've been in the diocese for about 20 years and there were some years when we had it, some years when we didn't. Uh, but uh, during my tenure, I believe we will be having something like this. And each time we do it, it's slightly different. Um, it's for the newly elected. Uh, there's a steep learning curve. And if you just come into a vestry meeting after you're elected and think, oh, I'm going to be ready to get going and and uh, be a responsible, uh, knowledgeable vestry person, uh, that's probably not going to be the case. And so it often takes three to six months for people to really feel comfortable. So the idea behind vestry training is to jumpstart you as you um, are equipped for this new ministry. Um, there are many situations in, on vestry and during vestry meetings when um, you get to kind of borderline decisions. And if we have people who are trained, uh, it's much less likely that you'll be manipulated in those decisions. Um, I know you're going to find this really hard to believe that some clergy and vestry are so used to doing what they've always done uh, that they don't know that some of the things that they're doing uh, are in violation of diocesan canon or policy. Um, another reason for vestry training, uh, upload a little bit of knowledge now, and it may save you some costly problems and litigation, potential litigation in the future. And of course, so you can be a more effective <clears throat> vestry member. Uh, as a way of, of leaning into this vestry training, I'm going to give you a very three uh, quick three question test. So question one, let's suppose it is vestry election time and uh, the spouse of a deacon who is at your church or perhaps a priest who, though he's not employed, a retired clergy who steps in from time to time, uh, helps with pastoral care, maybe takes a, a service every now and then. And uh, the spouse or family member uh, wants to serve on the vestry and you're desperate to find um, nominees. Um, and this person offers themselves, oh, I'd be happy to serve on the vestry. Can they? That's question one. Number two, uh, someone moved to your church and uh, they're from another diocese and they were treasurer in their last church and uh, you don't have a treasurer. So uh, you agree that they can be your treasurer and you're preparing for the annual meeting and you discover that this new treasurer has neglected to include the balance sheet in the uh, packet of financial information for the annual meeting. So you go to the treasurer, you ask, um, you know, how come there's no balance sheet? And the treasurer responds and says, well, Father, you really don't want the congregation to really know how much money we have, it will destroy our stewardship program. You'll see, that's why I didn't include it. Is that okay? And question number three, 
things have been tough for old St. Swithin's in the swamp and the rector and vestry look at all the space that goes vacant week after week. The rector decides to rent the education building and finds an existing school willing to rent the space for several thousand dollars a month. The rector and board of directors of the school drop a lease for the space and rejoice at the windfall to help the budget. Was anything done in this scenario that violates the canons? Three quick questions. Let's see how you did. Number one, no, that person can't run for the vestry. Now, they also cannot serve on a search committee. If you are a family member, a spouse um, of anyone who is engaged at the parish, notice it doesn't say employed, uh, you are not able to serve. That is diocesan canon 17, section four. How about the treasurer who isn't gonna include a balance sheet or just give the congregation partial information at the annual meeting? Well, if you go to diocesan canon 20, section one, you'll see that each year at the annual meeting, a detailed statement of all parochial funds has to be reported to the annual meeting of the congregation. And then there is question number three. How about this great idea, let's rent out some of that space. Well, uh, you may be able to do that, but if you go to diocesan canon 21, uh, matters such as this, like a, a leasing out of space, actually does have the potential to legally encumber the um, congregation. So, uh, in those situations, you need to contact the chair of the Real Estate Commission or me, uh, we're in touch regularly. Um, the chairman of the Real Estate Commission will be involved in any lease or agreement that is made, and that requires the consent of the diocesan board. So, great idea but go through the steps to make sure that um, you are in sync with the canons. <clears throat> what is a vestry? Um, originally, uh, the word vestry um, was what we now call a sacristy, the room in which uh, vestments, vessels, and other things for worship were kept, uh, where the clergy robed. Um, that was originally called the vestry. But nowadays, the vestry is not a room, but a place where typically church meetings take place. The word came to mean an elected body composed of the rector and a group of elected parishioners administering the temporal affairs of the parish. Uh, there is, um, in some congregations, uh, a debate which the canons spell out very clearly that the rector is a member of the vestry. They may vote. They don't normally, but they may vote <clears throat> in any matter that comes before um, the vestry. Um, so that's technically what a vestry is. But the canons also give us a little bit more information. Um, let me adjust my screen just a bit. There we go. Um, there are only two canons in the national canons of the Episcopal Church that actually deal with local parishes and congregations and thus with vestries. The first one is Title I, Canon 13, and I'm not going to go through this in detail because this is a very unique situation. Um, in 
some of our rural, more rural dioceses, we have uh, clergy who are serving in multiple uh, cures, multiple parishes. And uh, the question has been raised, um, well, do they get to vote in the uh, annual convention? What if you're serving a parish that is divided into two dioceses? And basically, this is a lot of verbiage that says you really only get to vote in the annual meeting or the convention of the diocese where you are cannot, where the clergy is canonically resident. It also gives some broad guidelines about um, parishes that may be thinking about uh, creating a new parish or a new church start or church plant. And um, they speak about uh, guidelines. Um, our diocesan ca uh, canons are much more uh, detailed in this regard, but this just gives them the broad brushstroke of how to determine parish boundaries and what if um, uh, parish boundaries cross, it provides some uh, legal guidance um, for that. The next canon that deals with <coughs> parish vestries is, uh, this is the national canons, uh, Title I, Canon 14. Um, note it says in every parish the, of this church, the number, mode of selection, and term of office of wardens and members of the vestry with the qualifications of voters, dot, 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 um, will um, um, be within certain guidelines. <clears throat> In the Diocese of Central Florida, these guidelines are spelled out in the um, uh, diocesan canons. Um, the number of vestry persons. In our canon, uh, canons, the smallest vestry uh, is five people. You can have no fewer than five. Uh, there is not a maximum number. Um, the mode of selection, uh, vestry are um, elected. Um, the senior warden um, in our canons is appointed by the um, rector um, and the junior warden is elected by the vestry. Um, also in terms of other members of the vestry, our canons state that both the treasurer and the secretary of the vestry uh, neither of whom have to be members of the vestry. Uh, they can be members of the congregation. They are elected annually. So even if you have a treasurer who is uh, coming back year after year at your January vestry meeting, uh, you should uh, reelect that person um, to office uh, because the canons say that they are elected annually. Um, uh, the qualifications of voters in this diocese, our diocesan canons, again, are uh, much stricter. Uh, in order to vote, uh, you have to uh, be 16. Uh, in order to be elected to the vestry, you have to be 18. But eligible to vote is 16. Um, you have to be regular in um, worship. You have to, um, uh, there, there are a few other uh, guidelines. Um, the vestry, and that includes uh, both the rector and the members of the vestry, uh, are the agents and legal representatives of the parish and then um, in our diocese, uh, the rector is a member of the vestry and normally presides um, at the vestry meetings. Uh, there are some clergy who designate that to a senior warden, um, but um, 
in our diocese, uh, as well as the guidelines, default guidelines of the national canons, is that the rector will preside at the vestry meeting. Now, when it comes to the diocesan canons, um, the primary canons that you will be dealing with that affect the congregation and the vestry are canons 15 through canon 25. Um, if you have a parish school, um, there are some additional uh, canons that, that you want to look at. But for our purpose today, um, we're going to be dealing primarily with these canons. Uh, they are lengthy. I do advise you uh, to read them at some point, uh, preferably sooner than later. Um, but um, I'm going to give you a highlight of the main issues that are addressed in the canons. <clears throat> uh, first of all, um, when the annual meeting, um, it has to be within 60 days uh, on or before January 31st. So you could actually have your annual meeting in early December. Um, a part of the reason why most churches have them in January is they wait until um, the books are closed from the previous year. And then that way they can give a reporting of <clears throat> the previous year's uh, income and expense to the congregation if they have the meeting uh, from mid to late January. Uh, that date uh, is set by the rector. It has to be approved by the vestry. And it also needs to be communicated to the parish at least 30 days uh, before, before the annual meeting. Uh, as we mentioned, uh, vestry has to have at least five. Most vestries in our diocese are between nine and 12. Um, in your parish bylaws, and yes, every parish has an article of incorporation and every parish has a set of parish bylaws. They should be modeled by the model bylaws that are in the um, resource section of the diocesan um, uh, website. But uh, in your article of incorporation or bylaws, it will designate how many vestry you are supposed to have. So if you will have somebody pull out that copy out of the dusty drawer, um, read the last version of your bylaws. And those bylaws do have to be signed by the bishop uh, in order to be enforced. Um, so if you find the last copy of the parish bylaws with the bishop's signature, um, those are the ones that you are or should be operating under. Um, who is eligible to run for the vestry? Uh, we talked about this briefly in one of the questions. Um, you may, may not be employed or engaged by the parish may not be the spouse or immediate family member of any person engaged by the parish. And if you are a clergy or a deacon, whether you receive salary or not is immaterial. What does matter is you're deemed engaged by the parish if you're actively involved in parish ministry. Um, what do we do if we get to the annual meeting and we were not able to strong arm or encourage uh, people to run for the vestry um, and uh, you get there and you have no nominees um, and there are no nominations from the floor? Well, curiously, I can't imagine that happening, uh, but the canons do say if no one is elected or let's say you have 
four slots and you only have three people elected, one of those people remains on the vestry until their successor is chosen. Um, typically what happens in those situations, uh, the person could continue to serve one more year. They don't serve another full term, but typically um, the vestry or rector will uh, nominate someone to um, take that slot and then the former uh, the person who carried over after the annual meeting is uh, um, off the vestry and the new person uh, comes on. Uh, they do not come on as a, um, a, a regular vestry me member. They would only serve until the next annual meeting. Um, some people are surprised to learn that uh, you can be removed. Um, if you're a vestry person, um, if you, uh, there, there are reasons why vestry uh, people uh, may be removed. Uh, it can be with or without cause, according to the diocesan canons. Um, if you, uh, if there is a groundswell of support of members of the parish, um, that say we want this particular person to be removed from the vestry. There can be a called parish meeting. Uh, notice of that meeting uh, has to be sent out to either by email or regular mail or through the parish newsletter. Um, uh, you have to let people know that the purpose of the meeting is to recall a member or members of the vestry. You have to state the purpose of the meeting. You can't just say, oh, we're gonna have an annual, uh, a called parish meeting. We have some, something we wanna discuss. That, that won't cut it. Um, you have to state the purpose of the meeting as well as the specific members of the vestry that you're seeking to remove. Now, Typically, if things have gotten to that point, um, I am going to be asked to come and be your guest at that uh, called meeting uh, as canon to the ordinary. Um, but uh, I will be the one who makes sure more than likely that all of this is done according to the canons. Um, if there are multiple people who are gonna be removed from the vestry, there has to be a separate vote for each person to be removed. And then if at that uh, called parish meeting, there are sufficient votes to um, remove those individuals, the vacancies that are created by those votes have to be filled by members who are at the same meeting. So, Obviously, the idea is they will have been privy to the discussion. They know the reasons uh, why people are being removed, and they will decide whether they want to step into that role or not. Um, so they can be removed by members of the parish. They can be removed by a two-thirds vote of the vestry, okay? But please note, with the consent of the rector and ecclesiastical authority. Whenever you see ecclesiastical authority, it normally means bishop, as long as we have a bishop um, who is in place uh, in the diocese. So um, if the vestry are going to vote to remove one of their, their members, they have to have the consent of the rector and the bishop. Um, so you've been to this contentious vestry meeting um, uh, or called parish meeting. Somebody gets removed from the vestry and then you have to reelect someone at that meeting uh, to serve on the vestry. You can't nominate the person who was just removed um, at that meeting 
to step back onto the vestry. They have to wait until the next annual meeting um, to run for um, election. And if someone is removed, uh, the former vestry person has to turn over any and all records of the vestry in his or her possession. Um, as I mentioned, uh, the senior warden is appointed by the rector, uh, has to be 18 and a confirmed communicant in good standing. Um, there are some uh, clergy that appoint a senior warden um, and let's say they're coming new on the vestry, they're gonna be there for three years. Um, they ask them to be senior warden for all three years. Mm. I can imagine that there are situations where that would provide some stability, but the canons actually say that the senior warden is appointed annually. So at that January meeting, or as soon uh, you could actually do it at the um, annual meeting of the parish, uh, the rector could simply announce that person X is going to be the senior warden um, again. Uh, the junior warden is elected by the vestry. Again, that is an annual election. Um, uh, the secretary, uh, again, is elected annually. This is the person that takes and records the minutes of the vestry uh, proceedings. Um, any public act of the vestry, so Let's say the vestry uh, decided uh, we're going to uh, send a card or a note of sympathy to uh, someone in the parish who uh, their, one of their family members died. Um, that could be a job of the secretary of the vestry. Um, if there was something that came up at, at the vestry meeting, that required a formal communication with the diocese, again, the secretary would do that. Um, it is the secretary's responsibility uh, to preserve all records and papers belonging to the parish. I wanna say something about this because um, typically one of the things that I see happening uh, over and over is that the secretary preserves and records all the papers and that's their copy, their kind of working copy. Um, a lot of things get included in the secretary's folder or notebook that don't really need to be a part of this um, records of the parish. So uh, I recommend that the copy of um, whatever is going to be the uh, parish record copy, that that be filed um, in the parish office um, after each vestry meeting, but then that helps separate out the um, uh, records of the parish as well from the records of the secretary. Um, any duties that are assigned to uh, the secretary by the rector, um, this is not the secretary of the parish, but the secretary of the vestry, um, faithfully delivered to the su successor, all books and documents belonging to the parish. And again, if the uh, books and documents belonging to the parish are in the parish office, it's just, hey, here's this, these uh, records. Um, uh, and the secretary does not have to be a um, member of the vestry. Treasurer likewise is elected annually. And, uh, we have people who have been treasurers for years and years and years. They should be elected each January to fulfill that role. Um, they shall be bonded in a suitable amount. If you have any question about that, um, Earl Pickett at the diocesan office will be happy to answer that. 
um, all books and accounts shall be audited annually. Now, the vestry can elect to audit the books anytime. Uh, it frequently happens if you have a treasurer who leaves um, mid-year. Um, for everyone's sake, uh, the books should be audited um, when they are turned over, um, when the treasurer leaves, um, so that the new treasurer will start out with a clean slate. But they are to be audited annually. There are guidelines in the Episcopal Manual of Business Affairs. I'll be talking about that in length uh, later. Uh, but a copy of that is on the diocesan website. And it gives you guidelines for that audit. If your total receipts each year are $300,000 or less, there is one um, form of guidelines uh, for that audit. If your annual um, pledge and plate offerings are over $300,000, there is a different and obviously more substantial set of guidelines. In some smaller parishes and maybe even some larger ones, uh, the secretary and the treasurer uh, could be the same person. Uh, it's normally not, um, but also the treasurer does not have to be a member of the vestry. There's one other little piece about the wardens, and that is they are to take charge of the property of the church and see that all things are provided for orderly worship. So um, if you know your clergy doesn't have vestments of their own, um, that's a part of the responsibility of the church to provide them. Um, uh, it doesn't mean that they have to be things that the rector likes or appreciates. Um, their taste may be very different than the parish taste, but the, the wardens um, are to see that everything necessary uh, for uh, worship is provided. So what are the duties of the vestry? Um, it's, you will see it's an exhaustive list. Uh, take charge of the church property. That is both real and um, not just the, the land, the grounds, all that, the building, also the furnishings, um, all of those things. Uh, they are to make sure that the church's prop, church property is fully insured. Um, I suggest at least every couple of years, uh, you should review the limits of your policy and make sure that the church is, is fully insured. Um, it's the vestry's duty to prepare a budget uh, providing for the um, necessary requirements and expenditures of the parish. Uh, please note, this is a vestry duty, not a treasurer duty. The treasurer may provide the, the guts and, and most of the information, uh, but it's not the treasurer's duty to prepare the budget. It's the vestry's duty. Uh, regulate all temporal concerns. Uh, if you can see it, uh, touch it, um, uh, it's temporal. Um, one of the vestry duties is to elect, uh, with approval of the bishop, to call a rector. Um, if you are one of our many congregations who are going through um, a clergy vacancy, um, I echo over and over, it's not the search committee's job to choose the rector. It's the search committee's job to do the legwork uh, necessary, uh, interviews, all that other stuff, but they the search committee make recommendations to the vestry and the vestry um, is actually the electing body. 
uh, to provide for the rector's maintenance. Um, uh, this is um, with salary benefits, et cetera, uh, to keep order in the church during worship. Now, this doesn't mean um, if the rector decides that they're going to bring in a contemporary music and the wardens don't or vestry don't like contemporary music um, that they can say well we're keeping order in the church we're not going to allow those things in no worship is the rector's prerogative um, when we talk about keeping order in the church um, obviously the clergy's <coughs> um, focus uh, should be in leading the church, preaching, um, celebrating the sacraments, et cetera. And so if there were um, people who were disruptive or unruly, it would be the expectation that um, someone from the vestry would step up and um, try and bring that to order. Um, in smaller churches um, the, that don't have a staff or, or uh, much of a staff, oftentimes the vec vestry actually act as helpers uh, to the rector. Um, uh, what would be normally staff assigned duties in larger churches, um, but the vestry kind of act that role. Um, vestry meetings shall be held annually. Oh my gosh, does this mean we only have to have one vestry meeting a year? Well, technically that's what the canons say. Uh, I don't think the congregation would be too happy about that. Um, but the vestry meetings are to report, receive reports of the officers and committees um, and to turn over uh, all of those things to the newly elected vestry. Um, you may have meetings at other times uh, or when called by the rector or senior warden um, or at the request of two vestry people. Um, typically that's monthly. Um, the bishop uh, may call a vestry meeting uh, at any time and notice um, it also says the bishop's designee, and that could be me or one of the other canons. Um, issues or concerns may come up in a parish that require an immediate response. Uh, the bishop has the authority to um, call them. And uh, again, uh, if he's calling a special meeting, more than likely he or his designee will be the presider. Um, vestry meetings, um, as far as votes, you have to be present in person or by Skype, by voice, by phone, by video, whatever. There are no proxy votes allowed. Uh, no vestry person may cast a ballot for another vestry person. And the primary reason for that is if someone is, is walking in with a, a ballot um, from another vestry person on an issue, they're not going to be there to hear whatever discussion or points that come up that may have changed that other person's vote. So no proxy votes are allowed and vestry meetings are open to all members of the parish. I have unfortunately in the time that I've been canon to the ordinary, see people use what is typically referred to as executive session um, for matters that are an executive session um, purpose. Um, what the canons actually say is if you're gonna be dealing with personnel matters and that's typically um, salary discussion, or if there is going to be a discussion whether to uh, retain or remove uh, a staff person, um, you may want to um, 
have the rector may call for executive session. And what that means is that um, during that period of the meeting, um, no non-members may be present. Um, uh, the, um, any other matter that people may want to call an executive session of the vestry about uh, can only be done with the consent of the bishop. So if, if the clergy person uh, leading the vestry meeting uh, regularly uh, asks for an executive session, uh, either to edit the minutes or whatever the cause may be, um, that cannot be done without the bishop's um, consent. Um, special meetings of the corporation, that is the, the parish body, um, uh, can be called. Uh, the agenda needs to be published, uh, has to be at least 30 days notice, um, but the bishop um, may uh, shorten that um, up to um, 10 days. Uh, who can vote at these parish meetings? Anyone who's 16 years or older, anyone whose name is in the parish register, have they been faithful in worship the past year and faithful in working, praying, and giving in the previous year? Those are the guidelines in the canons. Um, and if there is someone who is um, challenging whether they can or, or can't uh, vote in a parish meeting, uh, the rector or senior warden appoints uh, a committee of three people uh, to make that decision. And once that decision's made, um, it is final. Uh, there is no appeal or arbitration. Uh, are absentee ballots allowed, like for an election? Uh, yes, but they have to be approved by the bishop or the bishop's designee. Um, so if, if someone is sick in the hospital, whatever, really want to vote in a parish election, they can do that, but it's by absentee ballot. The rector uh, shall preside at all meetings. Uh, again, the diocesan canons allow uh, a designee. Uh, the rector is in charge of all spiritual concerns of the parish, and those are under the rector's exclusive direction. Uh, the rector is only subordinate to the bishop and the constitution and canons. If the rector is removed or suspended, uh, the rector ceases to be a member of the vestry or church committee. Uh, the bishop may suspend elections, fill vacancies, and may appoint a senior warden um, until in the bishop's discretion, such actions are no longer necessary. And obviously if things get to that point, um, um, typically, uh, as the canon to the ordinary, I will be involved. <clears throat> um, I uh, have a couple of questions. I want to stop there and just answer some of the questions that have come up in the chat feature. Is the vestry recording secretary an elected position? The answer to that is yes. Um, can a non-vestry clergy spouse serve as secretary, I'm assuming secretary or treasurer of the vestry? And the answer to that is yes, because as um, the secretary or treasurer, they are not members of the vestry. Um, is the secretary and treasurer elected by the congregation or the vestry? They are elected by the vestry. Okay, so that takes the questions up to this point. Um, the scope of 
ministry of the vestry. Um, one of the things that I want to say is if if you just thought this would be a fun thing to do, um, my sense is you're probably uh, have volunteered for the wrong uh, position. A uh, vestry person uh, is a serious commitment in the life of the parish. And uh, the vestry is uh, in charge of a great deal of um, matters and concerns of the parish. The vestry, and this would include the rector because the rector is a member of the vestry are the agents and legal representatives of the parish in all matters concerning its corporate properties, relations of the parish to the clergy, et cetera. Ensure that standard business methods as outlined will be observed. There is a lengthy uh, operations manual. Uh, it is called uh, the manual um, of business methods in church affairs uh, is the technical name of it. Um, and it outlines just about anything you could imagine. Um, I will show you where to find that on the diocesan website. And any question just about that you would have, if, if it is not answered in the canons of the church, um, more than likely, it's in the business methods uh, book, uh, booklet, I should say. Um, uh, when there is no rector, the officers of the vestry are responsible for the continuation of worship, including the calling of a new rector. So that would typically be the junior and senior warden obviously because the secretary and clerk uh, treasurer are not members of the vestry. So the officers would be the wardens. Um, the vestry are responsible for nominating persons for holy orders. Now there's lots of steps in that process, um, but typically after the rector uh, or vicar votes to approve or decides to approve someone, for holy orders, uh, there's also a step in the process where the vestry are asked to endorse them. Um, they need to be aware of ongoing responsibilities and potential liabilities, including accidents and other incidents occurring on parish property or during parish sponsored activities. Um, what does all that mean? Um, if there is uh, an incident that happened um, that is going to have an ongoing uh, legal or procedural um, restriction on the vestry in the future, uh, it's important that there be a record of those matters. Uh, and it could be something as complex as ongoing litigation that takes years to resolve. Um, it could be something like a contract for a copier machine uh, that is non-cancelable and will be going on for five years. Um, the vestry needs to be aware of um, not only the assets, but the ongoing responsibilities and uh, liabilities of the parish. Um, they need to be aware of any violations of contracts, leases, or other legal agreements. Uh, if there's been any wrongful termination uh, alleged um, uh, or any other employment practice that has been challenged by uh, an employee or a previous employee, um, these are all things that are part and parcel of what the vestry has to deal with. If there have been uh, allegations of discrimination, sexual harassment, or sexual misconduct, 
uh, again. Is the vestry going to know all the gory details? More than likely, and hopefully not. But they do need to be aware if there is something that is pending or uh, potentially um, going to be impacting the church down the line. Um, ensure that the parish is adequately insured. This can uh, take place through the insurance audit. Uh, but they also need to make sure that there is uh, liability insurance, director and officers, uh, coverage to cover the decisions of the vestry. Um, another responsibility of the vestry is to encourage and support the rector. Um, notice it doesn't say agree with the rector, um, but you know, previous vestries called them uh, they have chosen them to be uh, uh, the leader of the parish, and um, they, you need to encourage and support the rector. Um, but that may also mean at times um, appropriately confront them. Um, and hopefully that's done um, in the guidelines and the gospel um, in private you know, take, take one or more witness. Um, but um, uh, again, if at all possible, uh, support the rector in public and in private. Um, uh, there should be meetings uh, with or between the rector and the vestry. Typically, these are meetings between the rector and the wardens uh, to engage in honest conversation about what is and what is not going well in the congregation. Um, in many congregations, this is done uh, by means of a mutual ministry review. Notice I said mutual. Uh, I'm not talking about a rector's evaluation. Uh, we have forms and guidelines, and indeed in some situations, suggest that I or one of the canons um, assist you uh, in that process. Um, but some clergy actually put out uh, an evaluation form in the newsletter once a year. Uh, gee, how do you think I'm doing? How do you think the vestry's doing? Um, so that uh, there, there just needs to be some format where there can be honest conversation. What's going well? What are we doing really well? as well as these are areas uh, that need improvement. Um, the vestry should pay attention to clergy wellness issues, um, uh, especially if it involves um, alcohol uh, or God forbid other substance abuse. Um, it could be something so simple as, you know, gee, the rector's, um, you know, lifestyle is not really healthy. You know, what can we do to come alongside uh, him or her to um, encourage, encourage cler clergy wellness? Um, it might be saying, gee, father you're, or mother, you're not taking uh, your uh, days off seriously, or you haven't gone on vacation in X number of months. Uh, when is the last time you made a spiritual retreat? How, how is your continuing education going? Um, anything that you can do to address clergy wellness, um, that really is a vestry responsibility. I also want to just tag here something that is not commonly known. Um, we try and, and let all the clergy know this. But the employee assistance program through the church pension fund does provide up to 10 uh, sessions with a licensed uh, therapist uh, to address issues that are going on in clergy families. And that is free to them, to, to all full-time clergy. Um, so if there is, is a question that um, there may be a matter that 
uh, therapy would help, um, you know, to encourage the clergy to uh, avail themselves of that. Um, I also do want all on the vestry to know that if the rector is um, in serious financial uh, trouble or has uh, serious medical bills, um, those are both things that uh, the bishop um, should be aware of. Uh, pay attention to clergy family wellness issues. Um, uh, I know that um, uh, if the family isn't uh, well, um, the clergy is likely um, not going to be well. So if there are uh, family concerns uh, that the, the vestry can help meet, uh, by all means, um, that's a part of your responsibility. And the vestry should be responsible for encouraging clear and direct communication between the congregation, the vestry, and the rector in whatever format. Uh, there can be listening days, there can be uh, all sorts of uh, means to facilitate that clear and direct communication. Um, and uh, okay, um, a question was raised on the chat before we move on. Do the treasurer and secretary clerk have a voice on the vestry and in vestry discussions? Um, for, let me answer those separately. Uh, the secretary or clerk, uh, the primary reason that they would have or need um, to have any voice on the vestry whatsoever, you know, would be a question, you know, should this be included in the minutes? Uh, is there, um, you know, they may read something in the minutes or uh, if they don't understand exactly what's just happened, it's appropriate for them to ask clarifying questions. But uh, technically the treasurer and the secretary are not members of the vestry. So the only right to um, voice would be uh, their right to voice as a parishioner. Um, as far as being involved in vestry discussions, not that they would initiate them, uh, but if they were asked for clarifying questions from the vestry. Um, as far as the treasurer is concerned, uh, it's the treasurer's um, responsibility to communicate with the vestry um, this is what's going on, this is our financial position, uh, answer questions about uh, financial reports, um, whatever. But they do not have participating voice and vote um, in vestry discussions. Um, at that point, uh, we're kind of up to the point where we have quest time for other questions and answers. Um, I would remind you that uh, Butch Wooten uh, has been on our Zoom call and is available uh, to answer any questions that you may have. So if you want to um, unmute your uh, microphone, um, we can do that. Um, and if you would like to um, ask me any questions up to this point, realizing we have a lot more material to cover and I wanna make the most of our time. But if any of you have any questions, now's the time. 
Okay, so I don't need to. The bar should be here between four and eight. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. I think it was just background noise. Oh, okay. Um, getting us caught. Okay, thank you. No questions? I, I have one question. Okay. Yeah, and, and the question is regards to the audit requirement. And I understand, I understand uh, the two, two levels. There's an abbreviated that is, uh, that is uh, for under $300,000 in pledge. And then there's the one that's in the Episcopal business uh, methods. Uh, and once a year, each parish is to conduct an audit, uh, perhaps uh, earlier in the year versus later, though some of the dates are, I think what I've seen through the practice stuff, uh, it's got to be submitted by September 1st after it right. goes through several hurdles, including the vestry reviewing the documents and putting it forward. My question is this, because in the business methods, it says a review of statement is not adequate to meet the needs of the audit. Uh, so say a parish, uh, has a document that is, that is entitled, uh, a titled, uh, review of statements and a re review of statement does not cost a whole lot of money. Whereas a full blown audit for a church that's over the 300,000 threshold. If a parish hypothetically has submitted a document like that over a course of numerous years to the diocese. If the document was not adequate to meet the requirements set forth by the diocese canons and the business methods, would the diocese flag that and have a discussion with the parish? Or do they just accept the document and file it? Um, typically what's going to happen in those situations is it will be accepted as submitted but if there are uh, comments from the clergy or other parishioners, like typically vestry people, if they call uh, something into question about something that was included in an audit, um, I do think Earl more than likely would step in. Now he's not gonna do the audit, uh, but he will step in and answer the clarifying question or look a little more closely at the audit. Um, typically, uh, and again, uh, excellent question, uh, Steve, uh, Stephen. Um, <clears throat> what is required um, by the canons is that you actually submit an audit statement. There's a document that you sign that says, yes, we have completed the audit, et cetera many of our churches do nothing but send that in, mm -hmm. okay? Um, in a perfect world, it would be lovely if we had copies of the audits that went with that statement. But uh, some churches actually do submit a copy of their audit um, and we're happy to have those. Um, but typically the only reason um, that uh, there would be um, extended scrutiny of an audit is if someone on the, like the rector, one of the clergy uh, or one of the vestry meetings brought it to our attention that there was something in the audit that they disagreed with. Thank you, that's, that's helpful. Where I've been at on, on, on that issue and I'm going to keep everything hypothetical, is uh, a document was done, and it was done every year by a third party. Uh, back before 2015, uh, it was entitled audit. And then moving forward for another five years, it was entitled review of statement. And then within the visit business methods, the Episcopal business methods, it states a review of statement is not adequate to meet the, meet the, the threshold of an audit. So I'm in that circular discussion of the document we have, was it a review of statement or was it in fact a practical procedural process 
of going through what you would consider audit, looking at process procedure and all of that type of stuff once a year to enhance the efficiency of your, uh, of your office. Thank you. Okay. And again, if you have any questions uh, specific about that, you can follow up with uh, Earl Pickett or myself and we will get a definitive answer to you. Earl, Earl will recognize my name and I got his number. Earl knows all, yes. Yes, he does. And he's been very helpful through things such as the thing we went through with insurance on, on January 1st of this year. So thank okay. you. Thank you. Uh, are there any other questions? If not, we'll move on. What is your question? Oh, okay. I'm suddenly I'm back. What should I do with the tax returns? What was the question? Um, if there was a question, if you would put it in the chat feature and I'll answer it down the line. Um, the next subject I'd like to address is the whole nature of clergy discretionary funds. Uh, these are uh, funds that are set aside for pious and charitable purposes. Um, they are typically funded um, through uh, one of two ways. Uh, one, the parish picks a particular Sunday during the month and once a month gives the uh, undesignated offering or the loose offering um, to the clergy discretionary fund. Uh, that uh, fund is what the clergy use to uh, assist people with uh, financial needs, either members of the parish or uh, people who stop by the church. Um, there are some churches that rather than do that, actually budget the discretionary fund with so many dollars each month. Um, and those are automatically deposited in to the discretionary fund uh, by the treasurer. Um, so that's how they are uh, uh, funded. Um, many clergy um, put money that they get for weddings, funerals, um, things like that, extra services, um, uh, sometimes even when people have a child baptized, they make a, a gift to the clergy. Um, those um, gifts uh, to the clergy, if the clergy um, uh, receive those um, themselves, um, those funds are uh, should be included in their tax return. Uh, a part of the reason that some clergy don't want to receive those is they don't want to pay taxes on them. So the alternative to that is to put those in the discretionary fund. And it's not uncommon that some clergy actually are the primary contributors to the discretionary fund. So those are the three ways that, that money can come in. Um, I do know of a situation in an, another diocese where an endowment fund actually fund the interest from an endowment fund funds the discretionary fund. Um, if there is no rector, the discretionary fund uh, there should be a member of the parish. If there is a deacon, uh, certainly is appropriate. Um, but some other member of the parish um, would be um, selected by the vestry uh, to be in charge of uh, that um, discretionary fund. Um, the canons are crystal clear. Uh, the discretionary fund belongs to the church. It's in the name of the church. 
in the um, uh, original um, time when that fund was created, uh, it was designated uh. by a corporate resolution of the vestry. The church's FEIN number, federal employment identification number, um, is on the account. Um, the clergy discretionary fund should not include any personal name, especially the rectors um, or any clergy. Um, it should be, you know, Christ Episcopal Church or St. Matthew's Episcopal Church discretionary or rector or clergy discretionary fund. In some cases where there are multiple clergy, uh, whether they be priests or deacons, um, this is just called the clergy discretionary fund. In some case, it's the rectors. But all of these uh, notes apply to both of those. Um, because it belongs to the church when the rector leaves, uh, they leave the discretionary fund. They leave the checkbook. They leave the receipts. They leave the statements. They leave everything. The account does not belong to them. All of that documentation is um, belonging to the church. Um, the guidelines for the discretionary fund uh, are that there be uh, persons in addition to the clergy uh, who are authorized to sign. Uh, it's typically the senior warden, maybe the parish treasurer. Um, in no case should the clergy spouse or any member of their family uh, be authorized, an authorized signer on the account. Um, I shouldn't need to say these things, but I can tell you um, there are some people that don't get this message. Um, some clergy speak a great deal about confidentiality um, with the discretionary fund. And uh, what some of them actually mean is, I ain't going to show you anything ever, regardless of what you do, what you ask. Um, and um, I, I guess what I need to say to them is an old saying, me think that thou dost protesteth too much. Um, the level of confidentiality um, of the discretionary fund, um, it's going to need to be audited. Uh, even the discretionary fund is audited, both income as well as disbursements. Um, <clears throat> and the audit um, is normally done by the senior warden. Uh, at the end of each year, the clergy will sit down with the senior warden. They'll go over the check register. They will talk about what each of these gifts have been uh, used for. And um, I will say that we have uh, clergy like me, uh, who have been ordained for more than 40 years, and uh, 40, 30, even 20 years ago, um, the guidelines for discretionary funds were much broader. Um, uh, they're pretty narrow uh, at this day and time. So um, that is, that is one of the things that we do. We recommend that the senior warden get from the treasurer a list of checks that were sent from the church treasurer, the church account, operating account to the discretionary fund and obviously make sure that was deposited into the discretionary fund. But then to look at each of the expenditures and ask the question, uh, the following questions. Number one, um, when we look at these, okay, is this for a pious or charitable purpose? Um, the discretionary fund 
is not to be a professional expense uh, account um, for the rector or the clergy. Uh, it is not to cover uh, business expenses that could not or were not covered by the church budget. It's meant for outreach, okay? Um, when the rec <clears throat> it's not to be used for business or personal expenses. It's not to be used for continuing education fund or to buy books. Um, anything that could normally go into the operating budget of the parish should not be uh, used, the discretionary fund should not be used um, for that. Um, there are times when clergy um, uh, need to, in wanting to help somebody, has to give them cash. Um, in those situations, okay, the clergy is going to want to be reimbursed. It's good policy that that reimbursement check be signed by somebody else than the rector. Okay, if this is a reimbursement where they're getting reimbursed for cash that they gave to somebody, have one of the other people who is an authorized signer on the check reimburse the clergy. Um, immediate family members of the clergy should not receive assistance from the clergy discretionary fund. If there are immediate family members of the clergy that are in serious financial uh, trauma, um, either the bishop or I should be made aware of that. And there may be funds available that we can assist them, but that should not be done through the parish discretionary fund. Um, again, I mentioned uh, honoraria from weddings, funerals, and the like. Um, if the clergy person receives those as cash um, or check, uh, and they use them for their um, uh, personal funds, um, then yes, it should be recorded. Um, but if they, um, if if a that's if a check comes through the church account. Um, what they do with individual checks that they receive, it's not up to the treasurer to, you know, uh, oversee those. Um, the guidelines in the <clears throat> Episcopal Business Manual for Church Affairs uh, does say, if at all possible, uh, if you are giving um, cash to someone, uh, would you uh, get a receipt? I will say that's a request um, of the business manual. That's not something that often happens, um, but in a perfect world, um, that would be the guideline. Um, what sort of records uh, are to be kept for the discretionary fund? Again, we want to do whatever we can to maintain confidentiality. Um, this is a, a quote um, from the business manual. A contemporaneous and ca uh, careful journal of expenditures from the discretionary fund should be kept by the clergy, showing the nature, date, and amount of each transaction and noting the ministerial purpose thereof. Such notes, along with complete bank statements, will be required at the annual note audit. That's what should be brought. It doesn't mean that the clergy are necessarily going to turn that over or copy them, but they should at least bring that record, that journal, with them so if there are any questions asked about the discretionary fund, they will have those answers uh, at hand. Uh, the annual audit 
uh, the rector in consultation with the vestry shall designate persons responsible for the audit of the discretionary fund. If for whatever reason, you know, the senior warden and the rector are, um, uh, they're, they're going through a, a tense time in their relationship for whatever reason, uh, the rector could ask another person um, uh, to be responsible for that audit. And then um, there is a, a letter or a, an email or something that goes from whoever this person to the secretary of the vestry or the chair of the audit committee uh, to let them know that um, they have indeed uh, perform the audit of the discretionary fund and that there are no expenditures that are not for pious and charitable purposes. Um, and there's a, there's a form letter uh, that is recommended that be sent to the audit committee. That way, when the audit committee gets to the, the discussion, of the audit of the discretionary fund because they are the fiduciary for that because it's a church account, they can use the audit letter from the warden or whoever was the auditor for the discretionary fund to acknowledge that that has been done. Um, uh, if the discretionary fund is endowed um, the principal typically remains with the vestry or trustee and um, the rector is only um, uh, has access to the interest. Um, and then uh, again, it's helpful um, for the vestry to review uh, all of the procedures for a discretionary fund and its use, and um, those should be a part of the minutes of the vestry. Um, unfortunately, most vestries don't do that until after there's a problem. So um, it may be helpful for the senior warden and the vestry to, or the clergy to sit down um, talk about the discretionary fund policy. They may simply adopt what's in the manual um, of business methods and church affairs. This is what it looks like um, when you go to the diocesan website. And there are actually guidelines for clergy discretionary fund. There's a whole chapter that talks about uh, the discretionary fund. That's chapter five, but then in chapter six are the guidelines, there are audit guidelines for everything, but there's a section in chapter six that deals specifically with the audit of the clergy discretionary fund. And um, uh, that's uh, the the guts of what I've talked to you about today um, are in that manual, but I will note that um, the forms for the letters that are written or emails um, saying that the audit's been done, questions that you may have, uh, they're covered very thoroughly um, in this book. <clears throat> um, at this point, um, one of the things that I want to do is I want to take you to the diocesan website. Um, and I want to show you um, a couple of places um, that uh, have things that uh, will be very helpful for you. Uh, these are things that are not restricted uh, to, um, you don't have to have a password or a username or any of that sort of thing. Um, so we're going to go back to our zoom. Uh, 
background, share screen. Okay, um, this is the diocesan website uh, as it currently is live right now. Um, you will see that um, this is our Zoom Vestry training uh, toggle. And if you click there, it will take you to today's uh, event. Um, see right here where it says uh, training Zoom link one. Okay, uh, that's how you got into this meeting. Um, after this meeting is over, this will change and it will become Vestry training video, part one video. And it will give you the link where you can actually access the recording of this meeting. Uh, part one notes, uh, right there, you can click them, you can download. Um, these are the Vestry training notes. Um, everything that I've spoken about. And if you decide that you, your clergy were not able to be here um, and you wanna review this information with them, you can actually click there and you go, you have a copy of the entire um, presentation um, that I've made to you today. So. If, your clergy wanted to do uh, training for you, uh, for your whole vestry, if, if they weren't able to join us today, uh, you have those access here. You'll notice down here, we have the link. It's already set for vestry training part two. This deals with completely different subject. Uh, that will be on March 13th again from 10 until noon. So we will have all of the same type of information, the notes, the PowerPoint, um, everything for part two, and that will be up uh, closer to uh, the time. Um, so um, from our homepage, and I want to this is what the home page looks like right now. And I'm Hello. okay. Everybody Hello. recognize this. Um, I do want to call your attention. Hello. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I did want to call your attention to okay. uh, the yeah. Canon News. This comes out twice a month. It goes from my office to all the clergy. If you have any questions about um, what are the guidelines for uh, COVID, the new COVID guidelines, you can just click there and it will take you to uh, the last Canon News. Um, and uh, again, you can click here and you can read all the new guidelines that are effective March 1st. So um, Eric Guzman, our uh, new communications coordinator has been doing an amazing job updating our website. Um, we're putting a lot of time and energy and money into that. And uh, there's a lot on here. Uh, I do wanna call your attention to one other thing and that is the Digital Digest. Uh, some of you saw the magazine uh, that went out. That's not gonna go out, but a few times a year. But the Digital Digest right here, um, you can click on that and that will take you to a regular offering uh, of the diocese you can right here sign up to subscribe to it. Doesn't cost anything. Um, but just to give you an idea, um, this is uh, going to be our monthly 
um, communication with the congregations and you can go on and each of these blocks that you click uh, will take you to a um, oh see where it says click here to read more um, it will take you to um, the uh, website and in many cases um, there are videos the reason we call it a digital digest there are videos behind um, this text so if you click here you would go to the bishop's convention address uh, if you really like the virtual choir and you wanted to show somebody that you can go right here um, specific highlights um, here's a story about uh, the new rector at Holy Trinity Fruitland Park, uh, Reverend Samuel Sengiyumba, um, and where he comes from. So there, there are things in the Digital Digest that will connect you more fully with the life of the diocese. And uh, again, I'd encourage you to uh, uh, sign up for that. And you'll be sent a link in your email anytime uh, something new is posted. As far as vestry use of the diocesan website, <clears throat> I want to point out uh, several pieces. Number one, in administration and policies. When you click there, you go to a major section of the diocesan website and there uh, you will see um, as you scroll through it this is the uh, manual of business methods in church affairs and all you have to do is click on that it turns blue and then it'll take you to the 150 pages of the business manual and you scroll down and here is all of the information that's included. See here's chapter five about clergy discretionary funds. There's a piece in chapter six about the audit of the discretionary funds. If you have any question about parochial reports or how long do I have to keep these records around the church? We've got boxes of files that go back 40 years. Um, or I, I don't think our bookkeeper is doing something right. You can actually go through here and you can click on anything or actually you have to scroll to it and you can actually read the specific um, text that tells you how to do things. I do want to caution you that there are some people who use this um, instead of as it's designed as a tool, they use it as a hammer um, or they disregard it. They say, well, this, this isn't in the canon, so we don't have to do that. Well, actually the canons do say that you're going to abide by the business business methods and church affairs. And this is updated every year. So uh, you can link there. Again, you don't have to buy a book. It's all there. Um, on the website, if you have any question about clergy compensation, uh, you can go click right there and it will take you to the 20, 21 clergy compensation guidelines. Um, please note guidelines is highlighted. These are not mandates. These are guidelines. But what the reason this is up here is we want you to know that this is about the, the average for clergy with this number of years of experience. 
So let's say if your clergy person uh, has five years experience and they're in a smaller congregation um, and let's say you, they can't afford to pay you $66,000, okay? But they're, you're maybe only making 60, okay? You need to understand how far out of the loop they are. Um, on this same page, there's the cost of all the insurance plans. Um, and uh, if you, your clergy person says, well, there's a big jump between year zero and year five, if we've given it to you in one year increments. So, so this uh, first column would be years of credited service. And uh, Earl has extrapolated that out for you. Um, if you're thinking about hiring someone, uh, here's the minimum package analysis of what it's going to cost you for an employee, employee plus spouse, employee plus children or family coverage. And these are going to be your bottom line for each of those pieces. Uh, typically, we don't go to those unless uh, there's a clergy vacancy. Um, what are the costs for supply clergy? That's all right here. Um, and uh, this is a rather important one, diocesan policy regarding lay pensions. Um, the uh, National Church adopted a resolution, um, A138 at the 76th convention any employee who works a thousand hours a year or more, okay? And there are specific guidelines for what sort of compensation and benefits that they receive. There has to be parity between clergy benefits and lay benefits. Um, if your clergy are thinking about um, uh, changing their health care options, the plans and rates and what all they coverage, cover right here. Um, uh, standard mileage rate for treasurers has dropped to 56 cents a mile uh, for um, the coming year. Um, if you want to contact Earl Pickett, the diocesan administrator, if you click there, it'll take you directly to um, his email. Um, we do have policies, uh, many policies. Uh, the first one I wanna highlight is the anti-racism. Um, there is a requirement that uh, vestry persons do receive anti-racism training and uh, we uh, if you will uh, click on that link, it will take you to um, how you can um, fulfill those requirements. And uh, there's actually a um, document we ask you to sign and return to the diocesan office that everyone on your vestry has um, read the racism, uh, anti-racism packet. Um, Abuse prevention, uh, I do want to click there. Um, this again is a requirement that all vestry persons as well as people who um, have any uh, access or oversight to children while they're on the church property, um, they have to complete a certain level of um, online training, uh, safeguarding God's children, safeguarding God's people. Um, and uh, there is a link right here to safeguarding online that will lead you to uh, that online training. Again, all of this is free, uh, but we do require um, that each vestry person has completed um, at least the safeguarding God's people 
so you will know that um, uh, those guidelines are being upheld across your congregation. Um, if you have any questions, if you're looking up um, bylaws and you can't find yours, uh, here are the bylaws for a parish, an incorporated mission or an unincorporated mission. And if you check here under bylaws for a parish and you're a parish and yours don't look like these, okay? This is the section that you need to complete um, and uh, fill in wherever it says name of church. Um, you need to fill this in, um, have your uh, clergy and, uh, oh, I guess this is just the bishop form, okay. Um, but you need to send that in. Bishop Brewer will sign it, and then that will be your new parish bylaws. Uh, there really are, are very few options there. Uh, if you want to read the Constitution and Canons, they are here in their entirety, both the diocese and the national church. Um, each congregation is required to have a disaster plan, like for hurricanes and other stuff. Uh, if you don't have one, that'll tell you how to do it. Um, and then the rest of this section is about ordination, um, the process, the steps, all the pieces. There's a section here for search committees, resources, um, and then uh, we have an alcohol policy. Church expansion is um, if you're going to be doing any sort of renovating, um, uh, counseling assistance to clergy and family, um, guidelines for clergy discretionary funds, sabbatical leave. Uh, every clergy person has a clause in their letter of agreement for sabbatical uh, leave. Um, and if you're not sure what it is, it's there. Um, although many churches, well, all churches have the policy, very few um, are actually funding it. So um, that's kind of important. And then this is where you go to certify that your vestry, have each person sign it, uh, that you've completed the um, at risk management policies, including the anti-racism um, uh, training, um, that certification is right there. Uh, here are guidelines for a baptism confirmation, Christian marriage, um, uh, petition to the bishop for a remarriage, um, when the bishop is going to come uh, and visit your church, uh, here is uh, uh, a list of guidelines uh, for y'all to follow when he's coming. And then if he's coming to confirm and receive, there's an additional list. Um, there's just one other thing I wanna show you on the website and see where it says resources for congregations. If you click there, it will take you to a series of um, options for you to consider for evangelism and mission, for stewardship, um, for here's vestry vital practices. Uh, this is a great resource uh, that sends out an email once a month about what other matters vestries are dealing with around the country uh, and ongoing vestry training. Again, that is free. Uh, it's a great resource and it doesn't take a whole lot of time um, but is super helpful. Um, here are other pieces about congregational development. 
and various studies that are going on around the diocese and stuff about children and youth. So when you have time, uh, go to that uh, resources for congregation section. And I think you'll find, if you're looking for some ideas um, uh, for your congregation, um, that's a great place to start. So, um, I know we've covered a ton of material um, uh, in the last hour and 50 minutes, uh, but I'd like to give the last 10 to y'all uh, to answer any questions as well as um, answer some questions. So let me go uh, back to uh, questions in the chat. This was a question about the discretionary fund. Would the checkbook register suffice as a record of expenditures? Um, you will see in the guidelines for the discretionary fund, they actually are looking for a journal uh, to be kept that includes you know, recipients, what all it was used for, dates, um, all of that. Um, if you can fit all that in the checkbook register, um, then I would say yes. But most clergy find that just uh, picking up a, a cheap uh, composition notebook um, that they keep um, in the same drawer with the checkbook uh, is a better way to keep those records. Um, uh, the direct URL of the information that I'm showing you. Uh, if you go to cfdiocese.org, um, that will take you to the main website of the diocese. And all of the resources that I, I've shown you today, including the um, link to this training, the um, PowerPoint presentation, as well as the notes, um, they are all uh, on the same website. Um, sal okay, here's another question about uh, salary recommendations. Um, uh, these are for full-time clergy and these are also for rectors, vicars um, uh, who are the primary clergy person. Um, this does not necessarily apply to part-time clergy. Um, there, are, there are other guidelines that are available but because the definition of part-time covers the waterfront from I'm your regular Sunday supply priest to I give you three or four days a week, um, those guidelines are extremely broad. So if you have a question about uh, part-time clergy, um, if you would email me directly or call me directly during the week, uh, I'd be happy to talk to you about those guidelines. Um, the safeguarding curriculum, uh, does. Uh, there's a question, does this have to be reviewed every year or once a year by each vestry chapter member? Also, <laughs> um, <laughs> I sent this person a, a molasses cookie recipe that um, they really liked. So she was thanking me for that. You're very welcome. Um, and if everybody else wants a molasses cookie recipe, just send me an email and I'll send it to you. Um, but uh, the Safeguarding God's People and Safeguarding God's Children, um, we do require that um, the vestry, um, everybody has to complete the Safeguarding God's People uh, the children only if you have direct supervision over children while they're on church property. Um, but 
uh, we do not currently have guidelines uh, for how often you have to do that. Um, that is something that the bishop and I have discussed. And in most dioceses, we ask that you review that at least once every five years. Uh, but right now, if you have already done it for a previous stint uh, on the vestry, uh, you can sign that document with, uh, yes, you have taken it, uh, we're good. Uh, but we do want everyone to take it. And uh, the sooner that you can get those in to me, uh, the better. Um, have some more questions. Yes, I know the resource page needs to be updated. Thank you. Um, let's see. Is there another term to name the clergy discretionary fund in the financial statement of the church? Um, it's old historic term uh, you may use, it'll complicate everybody and confuse them, but it actually used to be called mendicant, M-E-N-D-I-C-A-N-T, the mendicant fund. And uh, a part of the reason is that there was no question that it was for pious and charitable purposes. So um, anyway, uh, if you need another term, you can use that one. Some people, you know, direct outreach, uh, you could call it anything you want. Um, but hopefully you'll abide by those guidelines. Um, does anybody else have any other questions? If not, I see 11.58 and uh, there was a question somebody sent me by email, which is, where did the prayer come from? And it came from uh, the Vestry Resource Guide. Uh, this is available. Um, the, also, when you go to the Vestry Resources, uh, they cost about 15 bucks a pop, uh, but it's jammed full of lots of extremely helpful and useful information. And I'm gonna go back to screen sharing because I'm going to invite you um, to the Zoom training day, just to mark it on your calendar. Uh, we're gonna be dealing with uh, rector vestry conflict, clergy compensation and benefits, kind of recovery from COVID-19. And I would ask that you join me in this closing prayer. Dear Lord, we elect, but you confer authority. We occupy, occupy roles, roles, but you form, you form hearts. hearts. We are sensitive, are sensitive to who has who power, power and who and wants, who wants power. power but your son is place the week. Help us to Help care us to more care about, about vision, vision than, than about viewpoint. More about service than, than about, about rules. rules. More about, more about mercy, mercy than about, about marriage. Help us to Help have, us the have the courage to lead by lead serving. By and putting aside, putting aside the world's, world's easier, easier ways. ways. Help us to Help emulate, us to emulate the apostles. Not in the, Not early, in the early days when they like gave their power and preference. preference. But in the latter but in the days after Calvary, when they, when they prayed only for courage and wisdom. All this, this, all this we ask in the name of the one Led by suffering and our suffering. Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us. Um, and I look forward to seeing many of you on March 13th. Um, if you have any specific questions I wasn't able to get to, 
if you will just email me at sholcomb at cfdiocese.org, uh, I will be more than happy to get back to you. And if you don't have that address, it is also on the diocesan website under diocesan staff. So mm -hmm. I am noting it is 1201. Thank you for joining me. And I look forward to uh, seeing you serving outside in the diocese. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye.